So please welcome to the last talk of Volker, last talk of the day. And the talk will be given by Vyal Kulipchuk, who never wanted to speak about this talk, but eventually he agreed that he can give this talk. It's truth. Right? Yeah, this was not the initial plan, that's true. Exactly, yeah. right? So then we just told him that he could talk anything but kernel and luckily he just chose the same thing. So <laughs> in this whole of the program, you saw all kinds of talk, but for the first three, four days, you saw only normal kernel. Today you saw some streaming kernel with some dynamic data structures, which I don't know what those are. And now you will see a kernel. Which, for, which I can tell you for sure is not in the classical set. Yes. Okay? So now we have to talk about cut width in semi complete data. Yes, so in the program you've got a, quite a longer topic like exploring layout parameters, blah, blah, blah. I think that this is the title of the paper that this talk will be based about, but it will be about cut width, a graph parameter cut width in semi complete diagrams. And as Saket said, this will be about kernelization. But more precisely, this will be really a Turing kernel for this problem. OK, so first I need to start uh, unwrapping the, the title of the talk. So cut with probably this is something that you might be uh, unsure about. And semi-complete digraphs, I guess, as well. So let's start with the definition of cut with. So maybe you have seen cut with in undirected graphs. So if you take a high schooler and you tell him this is a graph define what is the width of this graph. Most probably he will not come up with the definition of tree width. Uh, he will get something a little bit simpler and most probably he will get something that is close to the definition of cut width. So the definition is as follows. So suppose that G is an undirected graph, directed graph, so now I need to think what will be the decomposition of this graph and the decomposition will be just a linear ordering sigma of the vertices of G. Of the vertices of G. I will call it also the vertex ordering. So suppose it looks like this. Yeah? Here is this ordering sigma. I will draw such pictures a lot today. Yes? Here are the vertices, they are linearly ordered. So now given such a decomposition, I need to define what is the width of this decomposition. So imagine that you've got like a vertical line that sweeps along this ordering from left to right. And whenever, when it sweeps, yes, at any point it is between two vertices. Yes? So now the width of this vertical sweep at this point, if here I have colors, if here I have a prefix be before the line, and here I've got a suffix after the line, yes, I will count how many edges of the graph are going between the prefix and the suffix. Yes? So have one endpoint here and second endpoint there. Yes? So if this is vertex number i, in the ordering, this prefix I will denote by sigma smaller or equal to i, and this suffix I will call sigma larger than i. I guess this is self-explanatory, yes? So then I count how many edges go in here. So this is the number of edges between the prefix and the suffix. I will denote it like this, yes? And I will also call this number simply delta of, say, the prefix. Where whenever I have a partition of the vertex set into A and complement of A, delta of A is simply the number of edges crossing this partition. Right? So this is the definition. So now I will say that the width of this ordering sigma is just the maximum of the number of edges I get for any such partition into prefix and suffix. Yeah? So this is the maximum over i of delta uh, sigma smaller or equal to i. Right? So this is the width of the ordering, and the cut width of a graph is the smallest possible width of a vertex ordering 
of, of my graph. Right? So essentially, a graph has cut with k when I can sweep it from the left to the right, seeing k edges at a time. Yeah, so it looks like a sausage of edge with k. Right? So this is a definition for undirected graphs, but as indicated here, I will be mostly talking about directed graphs today. So in undirected graphs, the notion of cutwidth is quite well understood. There are FPT algorithms for, for computing cutwidth of a graph. There are some approximation algorithms as well. Uh, so now we will think about directed graphs. So how to lift this definition to directed graphs. Yes? Uh, so essentially, I need to redefine the notion of the width. And for this, I need to redefine the notion of this cut, uh, cut function delta. Yes? So in the directed graph, there is a digraph. Again, sigma is a vertex ordering. Yes? And again, I will say that the width of the ordering sigma is the minimum over, uh, sorry, the maximum over i of this, yes, of the width of the cut between prefix and the corresponding suffix, where now, when defining this notion in directed graph, whenever I have here a and the complement of a, I only count the edges with tail in the complement and head here. So edges that go from here to here. Yes? So on the picture, similar as here, how it will look like, I have here the vertices. Here I've got my prefix. Here I've got my suffix. And I count only edges that go from here back. Yes? That traverse this cut between the prefix and the suffix, from the suffix to the prefix. I allow any number of edges from here to here, but I count only edges from here to here. Yes? So this is the width of an ordering, and the cut width of a directed graph is the minimum width of a vertex ordering. Right? Maybe I will even write it down. Okay, so while on undirected graphs, this notion of cutwidth is well understood, and there are many algorithms there. For this notion in directed graphs, as essentially usual in, in directed graph, not that much is known in general directed graphs. So I think that essentially from the known results, it follows that computing this with notion is NP-hard. But well, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, I guess. Yes. Uh, but even the existence of an XP algorithm, I think, is unknown. Meaning, I haven't seen a, a paper. No. Yes, there is one. Yeah. N power big O of k. N power big O of k. So there's a relation notion of path width of directed graphs for which I know that there is a paper, and you say that also for directed cut width as well. I verified it. It's correct. Okay, good. Then. If Sackett says so, he verified, then it is. I thought he was. Okay, good. Okay, so I withdraw this question mark here. Yes, but I think it is still unknown whether this is W1 hard or not. Let me not debate the size of this open question. But it is definitely open whether this question, this problem is NP hard, uh, is W1 hard or not. I would suspect it is W1 hard, but essentially this is, this is the state of the art that not much research was, was done here. But what we will talk about today are the two sort of dense, dense settings for this. Tournaments and semi-complete digraphs. So I guess that most of you have seen a tournament in your lives. This is essentially a directed graph where whenever you have two vertices u and v, you either have an edge from u to v or 
you have an add from v to u. Yes, so whenever you have two vertices, you have either this edge or this edge. Yes? Semi-complete digraphs is a slight generalization of this notion, where for every uv, you either have an edge like that, or you have an edge like that, or you also allow having edges in both directions. Yes? So, as it turns out, many problems are hard both on tournaments and semi-complete digraphs. Some of them, like cut with, as we will see in a moment, become actually polynomial time solvable on tournaments, and therefore we will be interested in what happens on semi-complete digraphs, because for these two classes, there are multiple non-trivial tractability results that you can get. Good. So first of all, I claim, uh, okay, so maybe now it is the right moment to actually say uh, what we will prove, what we will try to sketch at least today. So what happens is that on tournaments, computing cut with is in p-time. And this is a sort of very strange phenomenon, but uh, it's actually not that hard. On the other hand, on semi-complete digraphs, this problem is already NP-complete. However, it admits a very efficient FPT algorithm with running time 2 to the order of square root k log k times polynomial in it. Yes, yeah, so a sub-exponential time where k is the, is the width. And this is sort of close to being optimum because this NP-completeness proof under ETH excludes 2 to the small of square root of k. FPT algorithm. Yes? So we are only the square root log k short of getting tightness result. And what we will try to sketch today is that there is an order of k square Turing kernel on semi-complete digraphs. Now it is easy to see that the fact that this is a Turing kernel is no coincidence as there is no, under the standard complexity assumptions, and P is not contained in coin P with polynomial advice, there is no, there is no polynomial many one kernel. So, a kernel with with, uh, with the standard car production, sort of. Yes? And the proof of this node is actually really simple. So with standard graph parameters such as tree width or click width and so on, you can exclude polynomial kernels by just taking the disjoint union. Yes? And saying that this is an end composition. A graph, a disjoint union of graphs has tree width at most k, if and only if each of them has tree width at most k. And the same happens here. We are just need to make sure that the output is semi-complete. So you take instances, to make a composition, you take instances of, of, of the problem of computing cut with of a semi-complete digraph, and you just put all the possible edges. You order them arbitrary, and you put all the possible edges here. And you can easily see that this graph has cut with at most k, if and only if each of those summons had cut with at most k. Yes, so this is an end composition, and by the results of Andy Drucker, the problem doesn't have a polynomial kernel unless NP is contained with in co-NP with polynomial advice. Sorry, yes? You, the cut is from left to right yeah. or from to right to left? <sighs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think that in half of the papers is this way, and in the other half of the papers is that they were around. And it's, you need to be careful when citing the results. Yes. 
right? Yes. <laughs> that is actually true. Yes. Good. Right. So now let's make as a warm up this proof that on tournaments the problem is in P time. And here, the argument is actually quite simple. So suppose I've got some layout already, some vertex ordering sigma, yes? And I've got some prefix A and suffix B of this layout. How do I compute how many edges are going from B to A? Yes? So how can I write down what is the number of edges going from, uh, sorry, from B to A. Well, I could do the following. I could sum up through all the vertices of B their outer degrees, right? But then I have counted all the edges going from B to A and also all the edges going inside of B, yes? But how many edges are going inside of B if this is a tournament, yes? Exactly the size of B choose 2, right? Which is a fixed number if the suffix has a fixed size, right? So now the argument is that if I sort the, the vertices by out degrees, pushing the lowest out degrees furthest, yes, then I simultaneously minimize this value for all the prefix suffix cuts, right? So if I sort the vertices by out degrees, then I simultaneously uh, minimize all the cuts, so this has the best possible width, yes? So this implies that sorting by out degrees minimizes cut width on tournaments. Okay, but this argument already doesn't work for, uh, for semi-complete diagrams because I can have more edges inside of B, yes? But I will now give a two approximation on semi-complete. I will not give all the details, the argument is actually really simple. The idea is that if you have between U and V an edge like this, let me assign it Y to 1 as usual. If I have an edge like that, I will also assume, give it weight one, but let me now relax the notion of a semi-complete digraph. Whenever I have those symmetric arcs, let me assign weight one half to each of those arcs. So whenever calculating degrees, I will treat those edges as having weight one half, and whenever calculating the size of cuts, I will also assume that these edges contribute with one half, right? So this is sort of a fractional tournament where between every two vertices I have total weight of one of edges. So with this reweighting, this observation just works again. Yes? So with this observation I can also sort by out degrees. Yes? But I have distorted the weight of every cut by at most factor two. Yes? So how this approximation algorithm works? I reweight the vertices like that. I sort by out degrees, and this is a two approximation, right? Okay, so we have already this two approximation algorithm. So as a first step of our Turing kernel, we can assume that we have computed in polynomial time a two approximate vertex ordering. So let me write it for the record. Step one, compute a vertex ordering. I will call it pi of width at most 2k. Right, because if I compute and it's larger than 2k, then I immediately have a no answer. 
Right? Good. Okay, so now what's the idea? So I've got this ordering pi, yes, which is to approximate. And the intuition in the, this whole business is that if I compute an approximate solution, ab approximate ordering, it is already actually very close to the optimum one in the following sense. So this will be a short lemma. So suppose I've got two vertices, u and v, so that u is earlier in pi than v, yes? And the distance in terms of the number of vertices between u and v is at least 5k. So 5k vertices in between. At least, there are. Yes? So there are two vertices that are quite far in this ordering pi. And I, then I claim, then for any ordering sigma of width at most k, so for any optimum solution that I could think of, actually this u and v will not be swapped. We will have that u is still before v, v in sigma. Yes? So any two guys that in pi are far from each other will be in the same order in the final ordering. Yes? So the proof will be on this picture. So let me assume that actually this is a little bit longer, 5k plus 1. I will get rid of this one at the end by essentially hand waving. OK. So if this pi has width at most 2k, this means that if I see this cut just after u, there can be at most 2k edges going here to u, right? From the future. Yes? Similarly, if I look at this v, yes, there can be at most 2k edges, 2k, going earlier from here. Which means that this leaves us with at least k plus 1 vertices in the middle, yes, that have the following situation. There is an edge from here to here because the digraph is semi-complete, yes, and there is an edge from here to here, right? So how does it look on the picture? If I zoom in, here is u, here is v, and I've got k plus 1 vertices looking like that. Yep, k plus 1. So these are k plus 1 edge disjoint paths going from u to v. So now if n, in any ordering sigma of width at most k, they were swapped, yes, they were in different direction, yes, then if I look at v before u and I look at any cut between them, each of those edge disjoint paths, yes, would, would contribute at least one to the width of this cut between v and u. Yes? This is a contradiction. Yes? So this means that this rigidness of the semi-complete digraphs already tell us that this pi, yes, is almost the right solution. Yes? It's essentially the right solution up to some local perturbations. In particular, what I can observe, so observation, if sigma is an optimum solution, so an ordering of width at most k, then if I look at any vertex v and I look at the position of v in sigma, then this is between the position of v in pi minus 5k and the position of v plus 5k. All right, I forgot about how to uh, remove this plus one. You just uh, analyze the edge between u and v. And by analyzing this, you can shave off one from this argument. Good. So my observation is that if I have any solution that is an ordering of width at most k, then actually the position of every vertex is almost the same as the position in this approximate ordering pi. Yes? Up to perturbation of plus minus 5k. Why so? Because if it was perturbed by more, by, uh, more than 5k in any direction, yes, 
then it would need to swap with somebody that was further than 5k in the original ordering. Yes? Contradicting this lemma. Yes? Which essentially means that how a solution sigma can look like, it is like solution pi, yes? But you just go along pi and you do some local, local perturbations. Yes? Essentially how sigma looks like, yes? You are going here, uh, maybe this will, this will be pi, yes? And the prefix of sigma, every prefix of sigma will look like that, that it will be like a prefix of pi, then it will take some, a few vertices, maybe a few not, there will be sort of a window where some stuff happens, and then it will not take anything at all, yes? And this window will be of length order of k, yes? So if you have already this observation, it is not hard to get an FPT algorithm for, for computing the cut width of a semi-complete digraph uh, by essentially doing a dynamic programming that has this kind of prefixes and as states and just guesses the consecutive prefixes of, of the optimum ordering one by one. Yes? Good, I will not go into the details here, but this is the way how you get FPT algorithm here. But let me now think of this pi and the sigma and try to think how to get a polynomial kernel out of these observations. So we are still quite far. We are far by at least one major idea from the kernel. And this idea will come in a moment. So the idea is as follows. So this is my ordering pi, approximate ordering. And I know that it is really already sort of close to being good up to local perturbations. So here is my ordering sigma. This is an ordering that I'm looking for, an ordering of width at most k, yes? In this ordering pi, I will be looking for sort of, I will call them milestones. So a milestone is a cut that I can identify in pi, a cut into prefix and suffix, such that I can prove that the optimum solution sigma can use this cut in the following sense. So if here I've got a milestone, yes, and corresponding partition into prefix and suffix, then I will be able to prove that the solution sigma can be assumed to use the same cut here, the same prefix and the same suffix. Maybe a little bit differently permuted, yes? So I've been looking for such really, really good cuts in pi, yes? And maybe there will be another milestone here, which means that sigma will be, we will be able to assume that sigma also uses this cut, and same here another milestone will be identified. So eventually you see that sigma will be essentially like pi, it's just that the permutation in those blocks between consecutive milestones will be different. Yes, maybe this will go here, this will go here, this will go here, this will go here. But sigma could be derived from pi by just permuting within the blocks between consecutive milestones. Yes? So this is the basic idea that we will be trying to find those milestones in pi. Yes? And we will be trying to find them so that the sizes of blocks here are order of k square. And this will give us the, uh, the Turing kernel. Yes? Because at the end of the day we will ask essentially about each of those blocks separately, whether it admits a, an ordering of, of cut with at most k, yes? But this idea, at the first glance, it looks extremely naive, yes? Why the hell the solution pi, approximate solution about which we only know that it is too approximate, yes? Should contain already some cuts, yes? That can be used by the optimum solution. Maybe this approximate solution is always doing something stupid, yes, and it's always off by one, 
because of some vertex being somewhere wrongly, uh, wrongly put. Yes? So the idea is that we will need to have some stronger property of pi, some sort of minimality property of pi, yes? that will ensure us that we will be able to find such milestones. Yes? So the goal now is to understand, to define some minimality property that we can assume about pi that will, be a, that will ensure us that milestones can be identified. And this minimality property about different width orderings is known already in combinatorics and was used for, for quite some years. It's called the leanness. We will assume that the ordering pi will be called lean. You can also uh, see this notion as linked uh, orderings or linked tree decompositions. This is, these are the same as lean tree decompositions. So let me now define this concept. I guess this board can go. So what is the idea? Suppose you've got a vertex ordering of your digraph, any digraph actually, and you've got here some prefix, call it A, and you've got some suffix, call it B. Yes? And you've got some cuts in this ordering, yes, prefix, suffix, cuts, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that distinguish, uh, that, uh, that cut between A and B, yes? So suppose that A, this is maybe sigma smaller or equal than I, because here is vertex number I, and if here is vertex number J, then B, this will be sigma larger than J. Good. So let me think how many edge disjoint paths I can have between B and A, yes? So on one hand, I have the max flow, Yes, max edge disjoint flow from B to A. Yes, so for sure this number is not larger than the minimum over all T between J and I. I hope in this way. Yes, delta of like this. Whenever here I have a cut, yes, that separates A, a from B, yes, then I cannot put more edge disjoint paths from B to A than the number of edges crossing this cut, right? This is obvious, yes? So the definition of a lean ordering, so ordering pi, pi is lean, if here we have equality for all i and j. Yes? So sort of this uh, a lean ordering is an ordering that is minimized with respect to like max flow mean cut duality. Yes? We are trying to make it as we are trying to make those cuts in the ordering as, as close to, to the max flows as possible, yes? And what we will prove in a moment is that pi can be in p time uh, transformed into pi star such that pi star has uh, no larger width and pi star is lean. So every 
ordering can be linified. How do you actually say it in English? Made lean, I think, yes? Can be made lean in polynomial time without increasing the width, yes? So then, by this lemma, we will be able to assume that our initial proper, that our initial ordering pi will be lean, which will us give a good grasp on, uh, on finding those milestones, yes? So how to prove this lemma? For the proof of this lemma, I need to use one property of cuts in directed graphs. Which is the property that is underlying all those magical algorithms for cuts and, and flows, like cut flow duality, uh, in graphs, which is submodularity. Submodularity is a very basic notion. It says that if D is a directed graph, and I've got two subsets A and B of vertices, then the following inequality holds. Yes? On a picture, if I have two vertex subsets, A and B, in a directed graph, then if I calculate the number of edges going inside of A and going into B, yes, then sort of uncrossing those two cuts into the intersection and the union makes the number of edges going inside, yes, added only smaller. Yes? 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 Yes?
and the red? Yes? And the blue is contained in the left side of the cut, while the red is contained in the right side of the cut. Yeah, this is just application of Menger's theorem. Yes? And the fact that we are having a counterexample to, to Lindes. Right? So let me now think of this here, this part between the solid blue and the solid red, yes, is sort of alternately in A. There are some blocks in A, and there are some blocks on the other side. Right? Good. So let me now try to augment this to improve this pi. How do I improve this pi? I just look at this picture, I take here this side, here this side, and I put them together. In the following sense, here this will be my augmented p prime, yes? So how I do it? I here put this prefix as it was here, yes? Then I put all the blue block, blocks exactly in this order as here, yes? And here I put the red blocks exactly in this order like here, yes? So I have used in this pi prime exactly this cut into A and B, yes? So this is sort of an uncrossing operation on pi. Yes? Is it clear how pi prime is defined from pi? Good. So now I claim that pi prime is better in some sense. So first of all, I want to prove that in pi prime, the cuts are not larger than the cuts in pi. Yes? So let me think about some cut. For example, let me pick some vertex v here, say in the blue block. Yes? And let me look at the cut just after v. Yes? So let this be x, yes? So this vertex v, it is here in, in, in the ordering pi prime. So this cut after v, well, what is this? How I can write this prefix? Well, this prefix is exactly x, the prefix here, Yes? Intersection A. Right? Because I just took this prefix and I restricted myself only to blue vertices. Right? So we have already A, we have already X, we have already X intersection A, the submajority rings, rings a bell. So let's write it. Yeah? So I want to bound the size of this cut. So let me write that X intersection A, the border of X intersection A, is smaller or equal, yes, maybe I'll write it fully. Yeah, this is what submodularity says. Yeah? But now observe that this was a minimum cut from the red to the blue. Yes? While X union A, yes, the border of X union A is some cut that separates red and the blue. Yes? So because this was the minimum cut, yes, I have the following inequality. Yep. So these two summons in total are smaller than these two summons. Well, this summand is, is smaller than this one. So if I now add those two things up, well, reversed, I end up with what I wanted. The cut after V in here is smaller or equal, is larger or equal than the cut after V here. Yes? And the same would hold if I took V from here. Yes? So what does it mean? The cuts in between in this region, in this ordering, sort of map bijectively to cuts in this region here, where the bijection gives you inequality between the widths. Yes? 
But in here, there is one cut that was strictly better than all the previously used. Right? So the cuts did not rise, and one of them dropped. Which means that the sum of sizes of cuts strictly dropped. So if I apply this operation polynomial number of times, I will end up with a lean ordering. Good? Good. So this is the, the, this is the proof of the fact that you can make every ordering lean. And if, you want, if I want you to take any technical thing from this talk, this is this proof. Because this is a very nice application of submodularity. Good. So now let us proceed to the search for milestones in our uh, approximate ordering pi. So we can already assume by this lemma that our pi is lean. Yes? So if our pi is lean, we can now define what will be the milestone. So think of it as follows. Here is pi, and I can think of this like histogram of the sizes of the cuts. Yes? So essentially, if I go along pi, and for every like, vertical, vertical line here, I measure the number of edges going from the future to the, uh, to the past, from the later vertices to the previous vertices, yes? I can measure it and I can sort of view it like a histogram, right? So milestones will be cut that will be like locally the smallest, locally optimum. So for example, this will be a milestone. So more formally, position i, i in pi is a milestone if uh, the sizes of cut of the cut at position i, yes is smaller or equal to the size of cut in position j for each j in between i minus, I think, 10k and i plus 10k. Yes? So a milestone is a position that is locally optimum within a span of plus minus 10k. Yes? In terms of the size of the cut. Good. So one easy observation about this is that lemma within every interval of length, I don't know, 40k square, there is a milestone. If I'm looking for locally optimum cuts, Yes, in this ordering, they're almost everywhere. Every order of k-square guys, I can find such a milestone. Why so? Well, the proof is actually quite cute. So imagine that you, here you've got this interval in the ordering of length 40k-square. Yes? And suppose there are no milestones inside. So let me start in the middle. Yes, so I've got 20k-square here and 20k-square here positions. Yes? So this is not a milestone. So within distance 10k, I find a cut that is strictly smaller. Yes? Then again, within 10k positions, I find a cut that is at, at most 10k smaller. But the whole width from the very beginning of pi is bounded by, 12, by 2k. Yes? So I can jump in this way by at most 10k positions at most 2k times. Right? Because every time I jump, the size of the cut drops. Yes? So if I give myself here 20 k square radius, I will not go out of this, uh, of this interval, and eventually I will need to reach a milestone. Yes? Good. So now there comes the crucial lemma. 
and I will not be able to prove it, maybe I will hand wave it in a moment, uh, that milestones are actually what we were looking for. So the lemma says as follows. So suppose i is a milestone. Yes? Then sigma is a vertex ordering of width at most, uh, at most k. So this is the assumed solution. Then there is Sigma star, yes, ordering of width at most k, such that uh, sigma star uses cut uses the milestone. So, in the following sense. Yeah? That if you look at pi and you look at sigma star, then the prefixes, this milestone prefix of sigma, of pi, is exactly the same as the corresponding prefix and suffix of sigma star. Yeah? They can be permuted here. But up to this point, both pi and sigma star use exactly the same vertices. Yes? And sigma star differs from sigma by permuting at positions i plus minus 10k. So essentially what I, can, what I say is that I can take sigma, yes? I can take this interval i plus minus 10k, and I can rearrange the vertices there so that my optimum solution, yes, uses exactly this milestone cut from pi. Yes? So due to lack of time, I will not prove this lemma, but having seen the proof that was on this board of making a, the, uh, an ordering clean, you essentially apply the same idea, yes? You just take sigma star, yes? You, op you look how this milestone cut in pi looked like, and you take this ordering and you just rearrange it exactly as in this lemma, yes? Then in order to prove that this does not increase the width, you use submodularity and you use the leanness, yes? And you just go through the maths, go through the inequalities, and you will get the same result. And this is exactly the same combinatorics as in the proof that I presented there. Yes? So this gives you this lemma. Yes? So now, essentially, this is this moment in the, in the uh, in the work where you see that you have all the tools prepared, yes? You know that all the milestones are essentially everywhere in this ordering, and you know by this lemma that these milestones can be used by the optimum solution. So now it all boils down to just taking the ordering pi, Identifying milestones, you need to be careful here. Where you actually do this proof, yes, you need to be, to be careful with technicalities. So you identify milestones so that the distance between consecutive milestones is bounded by k square. But for technical reasons, you also assume that is at least, say, 100k. And this you can easily do, yes? And essentially, in your Turing kernel, you ask for ordering 
the blocks between the consecutive milestones. This is not exactly the case. Uh, so the final theorem that we prove is the following. So there is a p-time algorithm that given d comma k outputs induced subdiagraphs say d1, d2 up to dp of size order of k square each such that the cut width of D is at most K if and only if the cut width of each DI is at most K. Yes? So this is the end result, which is an end Turing kernel. Yes? I can take the instance D comma K of asking whether the cut width is at most K, and I can reduce this question to asking this question for each of the possibly many instances, but each of them on at most k square vertices. Why do you need that lower bound hundred? Sorry? You, you wrote a lower bound. Yeah, we, we, we put a lower bound here for, for technical reasons. Just so that these intervals are not too short, because you will not take as di simply the diagram induced by the block, because if you just take this induced by the block, you do not control the edges flying between the blocks. So what you actually do, you take as di in this end theorem, a block that is enlarged by some margins to this block and to that block. Yes? And in order to sort of uh, have those margins in check, yes, uh, you want the blocks to be to be at least of length the margin of the next block. This is for technical reasons. Yes? So now if you have all those tools, you define the eyes to be essentially blocks plus some small margins around. Yes? You go through the technicalities and you arrive at exactly this equivalence. Yes? Which gives us this theorem. So I forgot to say that all of this that I presented today was a joint work with uh, Christoph Paul and Florian Barbero. By Bayer, Christoph Paul. <coughs> Paul and me. And it was presented at ICALP 2017. And this is the end theorem that we got. Yeah? So, in some sense, it is entering kernelization, but in terms of purely combinatorial statement, it is sort of even stronger. Yes? You can reduce the question of asking for a cut with of a semi-complete digraph to asking for uh, the cut with of its induced subdigraphs on at most k square vertices. Good. So this theorem actually has some more combinatorial consequences on, for instance, minimal induced uh, obstructions for cut width. And you can derive a few other algorithmic results out of it. Uh, in this paper, we can also see this lower bound, this, ET, this NP hardness and ETH lower bounds for this. So after this, uh, it seems that we fairly well understood uh, how cut width in semi-complete digraphs works. And even though at first glance it looks like a toy problem, it really has an interesting mathematical landscape, in my opinion. Yes, a sub exponential time FPT algorithm with a matching lower bound and NP hardness, and sort of a really true end Turing kernelization. Yes, where this end Turing kernelization is necessary and can be achieved. Yes, which is not often the case. Yeah. So I think, thank you for your attention. Mike? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. So 
Okay. So, lemma that he's uh, proved to be very beginning, the small lemma that says that if you use before we in the proximate ordering and as uh, is mm -hmm. yeah. it's always is up. Did he use it anywhere? No. So far, will he use it? Uh, I used it. Um, I used it in the proof that I did not show. In the proof of this lemma, you use it. Um, yeah, I think that's the only place. I think that uh, essentially what you are doing in the proof of this lemma, you look at how pi looks, you look at how sigma looks, and you know by this lemma that around the milestone, pi and sigma actually do not differ much. They, they differ by local rearrangements, yes? And you use this to for, for some reasoning of how you uh, uncross sigma to sigma star. Yes. But this lemma gives you very much intuition on how this, all these problems work. That essentially this is about rearranging a local, uh, uh, sorry, an approximate solution. Yes, Mike. Well, it sort of looks like you can use your lemma one about the 5k distance mm -hmm. to do a many one reduction from your original instance of semi-complete diagram question is directed cut with k mm -hmm. to a single combinatorial structure bounded pathway yep. for, which, for which the decision is finite state. You know, yes. So essentially, the uh, this is a very relevant question. So when you look at the FPT algorithm. Essentially, it looks like that, as, as exactly as you say. You construct an auxiliary diagraph on, or you can think of it as a finite state uh, system. Yes? Semantically augmented with other colored edges. Yes, 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 yes. So essentially, that you can view it as a dynamic programming where the states are like candidates for prefixes of your optimum ordering, and they look like a prefix of your approximate one, then some distortion. Yes? On a window of size order of k, and then nothing. Yes? So you can view it as an auxiliary diagraph. You can view it as a, say, small state system, yes? In which you are looking for a solution, yes? And in this way, because the system uh, or diagraph has size FPT, you get an FPT algorithm because you reduced a problem to the reachability problem in the system. Yes? Whether you can go from the state where you, everything is on the right to the state where everything is on the left by looking at consecutive cuts. So this gives you a 2 to the order of k times n algorithm. But actually what is happening, if you look very closely at the combinatorial structure of those cuts, you can limit the, the, num the size of the structure that you are talking about to roughly 2 to the square root of k, to 2 to the square root of k log k, to be precise, times n. And this is how the sub-exponential time algorithm works. It constructs an auxiliary structure of size 2 to the square root k log k times n, and then reduces the original problem to the reachability problem in this structure. Yes. Yes. Uh, Daniel. Is the, is the log k there in the ETH program? No, it's not there. Okay. Meaning we are not tight. We are tight up to the square root log k in the exponent. Okay. Yes, Mike. Well, we, we tend to think of things like Coursell's theorem as being about bounded tree roots, but it isn't. Yeah. It's fundamentally about information flow across cut sets. Yes. So this interesting question of whether directed coupling is FPT or not, not in semi-complete diagrams, but just in general diagrams, you can ask whether, whether the problem is um, cut set regular in a large universe of T-bounded graphs for FPT. Is that known? Is that known? So, it, it, well, it very much depends how you like set up all the definitions, yes? But uh, my guess is not because essentially in general diagraphs, whenever you have a prefix and a suffix, you know that there is a bounded number of edges going back but you have no control over edges going forward. They can have an arbitrary structure, yes? And when you are talking about some reachability problems from here to here or some cut problems, maybe only those edges matter. But for general, like, MSO f f problems that can be formulated in MSO, the structure of the edges going from here to here will also matter, and you will not get much information. This is my impression. Not quite the same question. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, we, we can talk about the offline. Yes. Yeah, but the, the intuition is that with all those directed cut uh, measures, you will get, you might get XP algorithm, but it is very hard to get FPT kind of results with with directed uh, with measures as a general rule of uh, rule of thumb. thumb. Any more questions? Yes, Henning. Well, there seems to be also a natural parameter like distance between, uh, from a given semi-complete digraph to a tournament. Like how many uh, double edges do you have? For yes. Uh, yes, we investigated it, and there is an FPT2 to the K algorithm for this parameterization. Yeah, as far as I remember. It's in the same paper. 